Hi there, it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. So Belinda and I will be presenting on knee osteoarthritis and um, effective man management strategies for something that is very, very common here in Australia. You know, one in six, one in seven Australians uh, suffer with this particular condition. Um, and so for something slightly different today, what I'm going to do is to present a case study. Um, uh, of a recent patient that I've seen. Belinda hasn't seen this particular patient. And I'm going to pose questions um, to Belinda. Uh, she's going to answer them. And, and then I'll present um, the case more and more. And hopefully you'll get the idea. And by us presenting the case, hopefully you'll see um, what strategies and what sort of assessments we go through as physiotherapists to try to help someone with knee osteoarthritis. So let's begin. Bell, are you ready? Very good. <clears throat> so um, I'm presenting someone here, a 66-year-old female who came into our clinic recently. Um, she has a history of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the disease is well controlled, luckily, um, but she's been having right knee pain for decades, so for a very long time. And unfortunately, December last year, um, for no reason whatsoever, her pain started to worsen. She started to walk much slower um, to the point where when she presented a couple of months back, she had difficulty going up steps. Um, it hurt with prolonged standing. Um, she actually wanted to wear high heels because of certain social functions she had to attend and it was getting difficult carrying and lifting things. And she still works full time as a school librarian. So that's all the information I'm going to give Belinda. Bell, and um, what else would you like to know to help you decide already whether this person has um, can progress well or not with the symptoms of right knee pain? Okay, cool. Thanks, Errol. So, so far, I feel like we have some basic information. So there's definitely more questions I would ask in terms of her history taking. Um, one important question I think we need to address is whether she's doing any exercise, what sort of exercise, and it's also important to understand whether there's been a recent change in exercise. So has she started doing more? Has she started something different? Maybe she's doing less as well, and these are all changes that could affect her knee, I think. Um, I'm sure most of you understand that the knee is a weight-bearing joint, so we it's also important to ask her whether she's had any recent weight change so has more more importantly has her weight gone up i mean going down is less important unless we're thinking about other general health problems but obviously if her weight has gone up we know that automatically there's going to be an increase of stress in her knee joint which could give her pain um i'd be asking about her sleep patterns um does she sleep well does she sleep through the night is she getting the appropriate amount of sleep for someone her age um, if you're wondering what sleep has to do with the knee, I mean, first of all, is her knee waking her as well in her sleep? But um, in general, we know if someone isn't sleeping well and a little bit sleep deprived, generally they're going to um, perhaps feel pain a bit more in their body. Um, has she had any other treatment, you know, any uh, physio, acupuncture, osteopathy, anything that has, has or hasn't helped? Um, and any other joints in her body painful? I guess... If it's an isolated knee pain, we know we'll probably more focus on that. Whereas if she's complaining of maybe hip pain or other muscle pain, um, I guess this might change um, some of the focus or how we assess her as well. Okay, um, I think that's okay I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop yeah. you there because you've, you've touched on a lot of things and, and we'll get through some of the things with different slides. So I won't address all of that. But what's your thinking? Oh, can someone mute there? Trying to listen. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so what's your thinking when it comes to exercise? Why, why do you want to know more about exercise and what exercise and how much exercise? What, as a physio, what are you thinking? Um, I guess I want to, we know movement's important and anyone who 
doesn't quite move enough, no matter what age group you're in, you're probably going to get um, more stiffness in your body, more joint immobility. So it's going to be um, harder to move things. They might lose more muscle mass over time, which I know is probably, I think Errol is going to touch on it later. Um, and generally, I guess, what sort of exercise have they done and, and how well they move their body? Okay, very good. So on that, and, and again, if people got questions or comments, please uh, make sure you pop that in the chat. So on that, I'll go to the next bits and pieces of information I'd like to share with you, Belle. So she used to walk four and a half kilometers occasionally to the park, but unfortunately with the increase in uh, knee pain since December, she's not able to do that currently, or when I saw her a couple of months back. Um, many years ago, she did yoga, but she definitely can't do that now. <clears throat> she's not done, if you wanted to know the type of exercise, she's not done any resistance or strength type training. So that's for, for those that need a further explanation. That's you know, exercises with weights uh, or resistance bands and so forth, where she's putting more pressure on her joints and her muscles. Um, luckily, she sleeps well. So again, on that, why that's important, and I think um, Belle touched upon that, sleep's important. Um, Belle, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we could wish for something for all our patients, especially patients who have chronic symptoms of pain uh, and, of course, fatigue, if I could click my fingers like that, I'd give everyone the skill and ability to sleep and sleep well. Because we know that if, if people sleep well, their body restores well, they can recover um, and, and actually their aches and pains improve significantly. And on the flip side, if they don't sleep well, seems like symptoms and pain and body's recovery just does not do as well. Do you feel the same way, Bill? Okay, very good. Next, uh, luckily, she's not had any time off work which gives us an idea that uh, despite the pain, she's still able to cope and push through uh, and keep working. Um, that's good to see. She does have a history of being diagnosed with osteoporosis. Um, and, and so that means perhaps her bone density uh, is not as good as it can be. Belinda touched on this concept of losing muscle mass. And I thought, at this point, this is something important to remind all of you. All of you who've seen us speak, um, especially over the last few years on Connect, I often tell this to everyone. At the age of 30, we all start to lose muscle mass. It's a concept called sarcopenia. And because we lose muscle mass, we also lose strength. And if we lose strength, we lose our ability to do things. And, and function well. And someone can actually lose three to 8% of muscle mass in a decade, in that, in that first decade when we hit 30. And that can double in our seventh decade. So once you hit 60, um, that muscle mass can accelerate significantly. Hence, a lot of what we do uh, in terms of joint aches and pains is to help people um, prevent that from occurring or if not, even improve that by doing strength and resistance training. All right, Bill, next part. So I've given you a little bit more information there about the, this case of this 66-year-old woman who's a librarian, works full-time, come in with right knee pain. What else would you like to assess? Now you're about to think about the physical examination that you're about to do in clinic. What would you like to assess or like to know? So typically, um, after we've got a bit of a history, I guess the next part of the assessment is getting a feel of how she might move and get around in her day. Um, she's still working, so she needs to um, be able to walk and, and participate in quite a few physical activities in the day, I guess. Um, so one of the first things we look at is a sit-to-stand. Um, the reason is that um, is something she probably does, you know, many times a day, and it gives us a... a a bit of an idea of how she uses her, her knee. Um, something I test in probably every patient, even if they don't have knee pain, is a squat. Um, this is really important because 
we need to get down to the floor. Most of us need to be able to pick up things off the floor, um, get up off the floor um, sometimes as well. Um, a single leg squat is then the next thing I would typically think about checking. Um, she's quite young. She's, I think, 66. But yeah. even in an older patient, I would like them to be able to perform a single leg squat. Um, the reason is, I mean, to get around the shops, to, um, you know, do a few stairs in a house is very important. And a single leg squat can mimic that movement quite well. Um, something that's really important to check in everyone is their balance. Um, it, it again, gives us an idea of um, important things such as like their, um, this patient's falls risk. Um, also keeping in mind, Errol mentioned she's got osteoporosis, osteoporosis as well. So if her balance is poor, it really puts her in a high risk category for fractures. Um, obviously that's not really, I guess, um, going to affect her knee but something that's important to um, educate her I think on in part of her general health um, I might also get a feel of I guess how she moves generally so things like bending to the floor um, and checking her spine bending backwards um, it just helps me I guess put the picture together of what sort of mover she's like and the last thing I can think of is probably just looking at her walking um, how does she walk? How fast does she get around? Um, are some of the important considerations, I think. Yeah, awesome. So you've just mentioned a lot of movements that really as humans we do throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you who have visited uh, physiotherapists um, or exercise physiologists, often um, these are the movements that we would check before we actually get you onto the physio plinth or the physio bed. Uh, plus, plus often when we, you know, as we call your name, if we're meeting you for the first time uh, and, and we're looking at the waiting room, we're also checking to see how well you get off the chair that you've just sat in uh, to have an idea of how well you actually do that. Um, so that's great, Belle. I'll, I'll give you then maybe uh, the bits and pieces of her assessment we did at the time. Um. Yes, she was able to stand up from the chair without using her arms, which, and the reason, the, the critical bit is there without using the arms so that she could independently do that with the muscles in her legs, which are excellent, despite having knee pain. And um, we did look at her squat, um, which was a pretty good squat, to be honest. Uh, and ability to get down sort of, you know, a full squat is the ability to nearly get the bum onto the floor, but she could get to about 75% of that, which it's a decent range. Um, again, uh, imagining that this person still had some knee pain of some sort. Um, but with her ability to stand on one leg, she could only stay there for three seconds, which isn't very long, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, uh, before she needed to put the other leg down to support her. Her single leg squat, Belinda mentioned this um, in her answer, Single leg squat's important. If you imagine single leg squat's what you need to do, which is standing on one leg and bending the knee at the same time, right? So you're keeping your balance um, and then you're bending the knee and straightening the knee. That's needed when you go upstairs, when you go downstairs, when you go uphill, go downhill um, and so forth. So that's a very critical movement to have a look at. And she had real difficulty with that considering she couldn't stand on one leg very well. And then I think Belinda also mentioned walking and looking how fast um, someone walks. Now, the timed up and go is a test like this where we get someone to sit on a chair and then we measure out three meters in front of them and they have to stand up, walk to the three meter mark, come round, um, go back to the chair and sit down. We time that. And so her score at that point in time was 10 seconds. And the data or the normative data shows us that if there's someone who does that and it takes 12 seconds or longer, that person is at a greater risk of falls. All of you don't go away and start doing that and trying to time yourself tonight, right? Just be, be careful. But this is a, just a simple measure for us to give us an idea um, of how someone is functioning when it comes to gait. Um, when it comes to balance, so the picture on the left, 
is a person, this, that's how we might check it, just asking someone to stand on one leg. Um, again, a predictor of falls is if someone um, is able to balance for five seconds or less. Um, a physio, and I, I'm not so sure about normative data here, but uh, we, Bell, how, how long do you like um, to see someone balance for? Like roughly, what do you tell people when they when you go? That's good. At least 10 seconds. At least 10 seconds. Good. And the quality of the balance movement is uh, good too? Not too wobbly. And for a, a younger person, and again, I don't know the exact you know age group we would count as younger, but I also would check without their eyes, as in, sorry, <laughs> with their eyes closed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't take anyone's eyes out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, if someone's shaking and wobbling around and their arms are flailing or, or yeah. um, everywhere whilst they, they try to balance there for 10 seconds, then you know, we would say, well, yeah, it's good that they can do 10 seconds worth, but, you know, they don't have the control um, or, or the strength to be able to do that much easier. <clears throat> um, and the movement that also Belinda alluded to was the squat, and that's the picture on the right. And the ability to do that unaided is, we feel, is a fundamental position or movement that... Um, a human being should be able to do. Yeah, it, it's critical to lifting. It's critical to getting on the floor and getting back up. So that's something that we want um, many people to be able to do. Now, Roxana has written a comment. Tips would be handy on keeping sore knee joints from stiffening in very cold, damp weather. Okay, we'll address that later, Bill. Um, thanks, Roxana. So that's a bit of the functional assessment as physios we would do. Um, and that gave you an idea of where this lady is at. So next slide. Bell, next question. So you've seen what this lady can do functionally. What else would you like to do specifically now as a physio? Is there anything else you would like to know? Um, yes. Yeah, so we already have a looking at a squat and a, a sit to stand and a single leg squat really paints a pretty good picture already because it already um, I think tells us how this person gets around a little bit throughout the day but we would look more closely at her, her actual leg I guess as well to give us a um, I guess fill the picture up a bit um, so first for looking at any swelling in the knee um, this tell, might give us an indication of any inflammation or um, maybe a bit more damage in the knee perhaps um, definitely looking at how her knee moves. So how well does it in a um, lying down position? So there's no weight on the knee. How well does the knee bend and straighten? Um, I would also look at how her nip, uh, her hip and her ankle joint moves. Again, I guess we know that if the hip joint is a bit stiff or if the, the ankle um, joint is stiff as well, it will put extra stress onto her knee joint. Um, I look at the muscles around her knee. Um, so do the muscles work well? Are the muscles big or small? Um, is there any difference between the legs? And we might do some simple um, muscle testing around the area as well. Um, things such as um, a calf raise, for example, for the calf area might give us a bit of an idea of how her muscles function. Um, and is there any muscle tightness? So any extra muscle tightness in the area um, might also put extra stress on the, stress on the joint. Um, so obviously we would assess her sore side, but I think in, in this case, the, the injury is on one side. So it's really important to compare all these parameters to her other leg, which hopefully, I mean, I assume there's no pain because it hasn't been mentioned, but we, I guess we want to look at what the side with no pain, how that functions and, um it works as well very good so you're yeah comparing so to summarize you're comparing both sides mm -hmm. uh, to some extent and then looking at all the other joints um to just clear them in a sense to see whether she can perform movements functionally um and so if i go through the information i think you mentioned uh swelling right at the start so she did have a tiny bit of swelling in the right knee. Um, and, and the reason why we check, I think Belinda said it gives us an idea as to whether something's inflamed still in the knee joint. 
um, even though someone has some osteoarthritis, sometimes, so, actually, someone with osteoarthritis can have no swelling as well if it's not um, inflamed at that point in time. But that tells us that something's slightly still inflamed uh, in the joint, and that can cause a little bit more pain. Uh, and two, one thing that's important, Belinda talked about um, looking at where, how well a muscle turns on. Unfortunately, um, a tiny bit of fluid in the knee and as little as 10 milliliters, 10 mils, not much, a like tiny bit in a, in a little cup, 10 mils of fluid will lead to the thigh muscle or your quadriceps, that big muscle at the front of your leg that attaches to your knee, makes that switch off. Just it's the body's defense mechanism. And that's why um, getting rid or trying to use medications or ice or, or compression garments to get rid of swelling um, can be very, very helpful for one's knee. Um, more information, uh, again, Belinda talked about um, her, the person's uh, muscle tone and muscle activation. Her quadriceps on her right leg was smaller than compared to her left. The activation and the tone in the right quadriceps for less. If you guys, if you watching today or listening and wondering what is tone and what is activation, can imagine putting, try, trying to put your bicep out there and it's the hardness in the muscle when you tense it. Yeah, that's what we're looking for because if someone can't send the messages from their brain to the muscle to turn it on, doesn't matter how much muscle you have, that muscle's not going to work for you. So envisage someone, unfortunately, who's had an accident and they, they can't turn on the muscles in their legs so they can't use their limbs. It's like that. And unfortunately, when we have pain, the muscle cells in our body does, don't want to switch on as much as we can. So in this lady, unfortunately, on the muscles on her right leg weren't functioning as well. I think Belinda mentioned looking at her calf strength. Um, calf muscles are important. That also gives us a bit of a push off when we walk and when we do things. Um, she really struggled to get her onto tiptoes when we got her in standing. So that was difficult. Um, luckily, she had full range of movement in her knee. Um, she had good hip movements and good ankle movements. And how we check those, um, perhaps if I focus on the, um, the picture on the right, um, we're looking at whether someone's knee can actually translate past their foot or ankle well. And that range there, if you can imagine, I, uh, hopefully you guys can see my cursor, um, that range of that ankle joint is important to be able to go up and down steps or up and down hills um, and squatting. So if someone doesn't have good ankle range, they're going to be stuck with a squat or they, they'll, they'll be, feel a little bit stuck when squatting. The same with the hip. If we look at someone's hip movement and they can't get their knee closer towards their chest or their shoulder, that means they can't get into this position here on the squat. So that's why we need to check those movements. So that's, these are things that we might do in clinic um, in order um, to look at someone's function. Again, with this lady, luckily her ankle and hip movements were good. Now, next question. So you now know all that information. She moves quite well. She's got a little bit of swelling in her uh, right knee. Uh, right muscle tone is not so great. Right muscle mass is not very great in that lower limb. Um, squats relatively well, but balance is poor. What next, Bill? Um, so far, I think for someone who's had, I guess, pain for a very long time, given her age as well, I think she's actually doing really well. So um, it's important for me as a physio to, I guess, reassure her that I think we can get her better, that her prognosis um, should be quite good if we do the the right, I guess, treatment or management and, and educate her about this. Reassurance for a lot of patients is important. When someone's had, I think when someone's had pain for a long time, it can be very scary. I think it's very normal for a lot of people to think, oh, am I going to have to live with this for the rest of my life? Am I going to be able to do stairs again or do heels or get back to yoga or, you know, whatever their goal may be. So yeah, it's really important 
as a physio that we do spend time talking to the patient about this. Um, I don't think we've touched on it yet, but um, how much pain is the patient in? Like how often does the pain happen? How strong is the pain? How frequently is it happening? Um, I guess it, this would give us a bit of an indication of um, how well she might do with potential treatment. Um, and is there what any... happens if her pain was high? If her pain was high, I mean, first of all, education around chronic pain is important. And um, some of you who have done um, some part, Connect Talks in the past may um, know a little bit about chronic pain, but we'll be talking to the patient about that. Um, what else can we do to help her with the pain? We ideally, in, in any acute or chronic injury, want to reduce someone's pain as quickly as possible. The quicker we can reduce someone's pain, hopefully the quicker they can um, get back to normal movement and things like their joint mobility and their, their muscle strength can hopefully come back sooner. Okay, so, I mean, we're lucky as physios, um, we do have some, I guess, tools in our toolkit, such as, you know, bracing or taping that can work very, very well. Um, and given this lady generally moves well, you know, if she does have a lot of pain, she might do well with just a little bit of help as well, which is, um, I think, quite a promising thing. Do you, do you think, sorry, you may have a bit more, but do you think can, people often ask, I've got pain, can I exercise? Yep. What's, what's your answer to that? Um, yes, we want people to move, but it needs to be appropriate. Um, yep. So if she said to me, I want to run tomorrow, of course, I would probably not suggest that. But we want people to to move within their parameters. This doesn't mean it has to be pain-free. So if there's a little bit of pain, but the pain settles back to its, I guess, resting state, I'm happy yep. for them to do it normally. If their pain really elevates um, in their score out of 10 by, I guess, more than a couple of points, um, I would probably consider them backing down. But it's about pain management until potentially she gets a lot better. And how important is that activity that the patient wants to participate in? Um, is it If it makes them really happy and it's really important for them, how else can we adapt those activities perhaps to make it more possible? Okay. Very good. Anything else? Um, and in terms of things I'd probably discuss at this stage, I guess, how committed is she to, um, to physiotherapy management, um, probably digging into her goals a little bit and what she would like to achieve. I think Errol mentioned want to wear high heels or do heels or something like that. Yep. So anything, um, you know, why is, why are those things important to her? But definitely, yeah, how committed is she to the, the process that we would probably talk about at this stage as well. Okay, very good. That's, uh... So you've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of uh, past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join VDC Connected now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from VJC Health. Look forward to seeing you in an event soon.